everyone. Uh, this episode of the podcast is a bit of a milestone because it is episode 101, which means that we have completed 100 podcasts uh, on this project. There will be more lectures uh, going forward, but from now on, they're going to be uh, fortnightly rather than weekly, but there are plenty more lectures to come. I want to give uh, a big thank you to uh, those who have been uh, supporting the podcast in the main by listening to them and uh, and hopefully uh, deriving some uh, learning from them. Uh, but particularly, I want to thank those of you who have uh, assisted financially with covering the costs of the po podcast. Your support, your help is is greatly appreciated and valued and allows us to continue uh, to put out these lectures. And uh, I also want to thank the technical team that makes it possible, uh, including certain individuals uh, whose help is always ready and appreciated. And uh, that's Malki, Adina, Dimitri, and of course, Marjorie, without whom the podcast uh, could barely happen at all. The uh, upcoming talk you're about to hear is uh, the final part of the series on the power of change and the challenge of Teshuva. It was recorded on Zoom at Caulfield Shul uh, last year. And I want to take this opportunity uh, now at the beginning of uh, Tafshin Pebet to wish everybody a Gmar Chatima Tova, a healthy, happy, prosperous and fulfilling a new year and uh, for all of us and uh, for the Jewish people and for the world. Hello to everyone and a Shana Tova to all and uh, a Gemar Tov uh, to everyone. Uh, to, today I want to uh, I want to get really into the uh, the nuts and bolts of some aspects of Teshuvah. In the first couple of talks we looked at uh, what we could learn from a few episodes uh, of biblical figures who underwent Teshuvah, and uh, in last week we looked at some episodes from the Talmud to get a sense of how the Talmud views the concept of Teshuvah. Today I want to take three examples from subsequent history over the course of around the last uh, 800 years or so uh, in order to uh, highlight three essential points. And I guess that the link between all of them is probably the concept of community, uh, but they all have different aspects. And uh, the the first one I want to talk about, I mean, we've only got half an hour, so I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, the first one is one of the most celebrated and amazing examples of Teshuvah that we have in Jewish history in the post-Talmudic period. And I'm going to uh, preface that by asking uh, a question, and it's a question that uh, occurs to me from time to time. When, when was the last time that you recall that a leader, a thought leader, a spiritual leader, changed their mind about a position that they held and said, I was wrong. I made a mistake and I was wrong. I'm not talking about spiritual leaders who get busted in the course of doing something wrong, whether it's a financial or sexual scandal, we got plenty of those who turn around and say, oh, I apologize for anyone that I hurt. I'm talking about people who stand up and shift an entire ideological position uh, because they realize that they were wrong. And uh, they are extremely rare right throughout history. And perhaps this is worth highlighting today because uh, everybody talks about how divisive the world is at the moment, especially uh, when uh, those of you, uh, the, the, not those, the, those who come and tell me about things that they see and hear on this thing called social media, that everybody is entrenched in their positions and everyone's trolling each other and uh, people get very nasty about their positions. And we're not hearing about anyone actually, despite all this uh, vitriol, no, no one actually seems to be changing their mind. People seem to make up their ideological position when they're teenagers and they stick to it. And they start to see the world through that lens. 
And that gives us a clue as to just how difficult it is to change one's positions. Not that you have to, but what we need to do is we need to look carefully at who we are. The process of Teshuvah demands that we break down all of our thoughts and perceptions and ask ourselves whether really uh, the composition of those thoughts are contributing to the sort of person that we want to be in the world. So I'm going to take us just briefly to the 13th century because that was a time uh, like today of tremendous controversies about a great range of things. And those of you who've done talks with me on the 13th and 14th centuries will know that uh, one of the great controversies in the Jewish world was a wave of uh, polemics that has become known as the Maimonidean controversy. Uh, and uh, it's difficult for us to imagine today uh, what this was all about, because today uh, a figure like the Rambam, Moshe ben Maimon, Maimonides, is heralded as a bastion of mainstream thought. Uh, he was, you know, the greatest Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages, the greatest halachic codifier of the Middle Ages. The Rambam is right up there. No one's going to kick you out of a shul in Bnei Brak for citing the Rambam. And he is uh, the bastion of orthodoxy. And yet, in the 13th century, there were tremendous controversies over the Rambam, over his writings, on two fronts. On the one hand, in relation to his philosophical writings, which were thought by some parts of the orthodox Jewish world to be highly heretical and problematic because they aligned the Torah with uh, the thought of Aristotle and other Greek philosophic thinkers. And on the other hand, uh, the controversy was unabated in relation to his great halachic work, the Mishnah Torah, because the Rambam famously didn't cite any sources and made some fairly ambitious statements such as, you don't need the oral Torah, all you need is the book that I've written uh, on the codification of the halakha. So these controversies were running, and one of the leaders of this very, very fierce movement against the writings of Maimonides uh, was uh, one of the great spiritual leaders and Talmudists of his time, uh, Rabbi Yona of Gerondi in northeastern Spain. Someone we now know as Rabbeinu Yona. And Rabbeinu Yona spent many years running around getting people opposed to the writings of Maimonides. He wanted them banned, not just the philosophical parts, but even the Mishnah Torah. It was all part and parcel of the anti-Maimonidean movement. And he got a lot of support. Uh, he had support from his teachers. He had support from his students. He had support from his colleagues. And this movement swept throughout Europe and culminated, if we can use that word, in around 1233, when uh, Rabbeinu Yonah, having kind of got into bed a little bit with the Dominicans, because one of the things that they did, this anti-Maimonidean movement, was to go to the church and say that Maimonides' attacks are not just attacks on Judaism, they're attacks on uh, all uh, Bible-based Abrahamic faiths, and therefore they're an attack on Christianity as well, and the Dominicans didn't need much convincing to buy that argument. And they organized for the books of Maimonides to be burnt in Paris in 1233. This was a shocking episode. All book burnings are shocking episodes. And all book burnings never end well. But the anti-Maimonidean camp within the Jewish world was quite pleased that they had managed to get the Christian church on side to, uh, to affect this book burning. Oh, nothing's going to show them like a book burning. I think part of what drives the uh, vitriol and polemic of people often in the extreme is this desire to express your anger that in some way that's going to shock your opponents into these great realizations. Oh my gosh, they're burning it. Wow, we must be wrong. We never realized just how bad these things were. But of course, as always, it has the opposite effect. Uh, many, many people saw the book burning as an absolute violation of Jewish values. Even if you didn't like Maimonides, to go and burn his books was a tremendously dark thing to do. 
But nevertheless, Rabbeinu Yonah in 1233 uh, was one of the orchestrators of this. And yet that had some terrible consequences. Because a few years later in 1242, and we've spoken about this elsewhere, was one of the most horrendous cases of cultural vandalism when we saw the church burn 24 cartloads of copies, manuscripts of the Talmud in France. Every single copy, the Talmud was banned in France. And every, uh, every copy of the Talmud was burnt in Paris, in the very same place that the writings of the Rambam had been burnt some years earlier. By the way, uh, that exact same time at which the writings of the Rambam were burnt in the early 1230s was the precise moment at which the Inquisition began, uh, the Roman Inquisition that ultimately evolved into all its various forms. But in 1242, they burnt every copy of the Talmud in France, 24 cartloads. And when he saw that, was the moment that Rabbeinu Yonah realized that he had made a tremendous error. Not just in organizing the book burnings or being a part of that, but in his entire outlook, he realized that that was a sign that he had been wrong about Maimonides. And he underwent a very, very intense form of teshuva. First of all, he publicly announced in the synagogue in Montpellier that he was wrong, that his entire, all of his efforts towards suppressing the works of Maimonides had been wrong. And he made a vow that he would go, and this, this, is, this is not just some, you know, minor rabbi in some uh, shul somewhere in some outlying suburb who decided that he would be a hero and say he was wrong. This is one of the great spiritual leaders of Jewish Europe in the 13th century who got up and said, we have been wrong about Maimonides. And he made a vow to go all the way to the land of Israel to visit Maimonides' grave. And Maimonides uh, was buried in Tiberias, still buried in Tiberias. And prostrate himself on the grave of Maimonides with a minyan, for seven days, he was going to pray and fast for seven days at the grave of Maimonides uh, with a quorum of 10 in order to ask forgiveness. We discussed this briefly last week when we looked at um, uh, what you do, what the Talmud says you need to do in uh, Masechet Yoma 87a, when the Talmud discusses about what you need to do if you want to seek forgiveness from someone who is departed. So he made this decision. But he only got as far as Toledo in Spain. So if you're heading off from, say, uh, Provence, and you're going to the land of Israel, uh, to get as far as Toledo is not that far. But in Toledo, he got uh, kind of waylaid because the community said, ah, oh, Rabbeinu Yonah is here. And uh, he ended up being the spiritual leader of Toledo. And he never made it to uh, the land of Israel, to the grave of Maimonides. According to some legends, that is why Rabbeinu Yonah died suddenly of a very, very rare disease. People were saying it was because he never actually fulfilled the promise that he said he would make. But for the rest of his life, for the rest of his career, he heralded the work of Maimonides. Every lecture he gave, he, on whatever subject, he began with a, an extolling and a quote from Maimonides, and he heralded the work of the Rambam as being... Uh, the great work of the Middle Ages in Halakha so, uh, and in Talmud. So uh, Rabbeinu Yonah is an example of someone who completely shifted uh, his thoughts. He not only did that, but he also wrote a, probably the most famous book in Jewish ethical literature on the subject of Teshuvah called Sha'arei Teshuvah, our most famous book from the Middle Ages on that subject, The Gates of Repentance, Sha'arei Teshuvah. And in Sharei Teshuvah, Rabbeinu Gershom does a tremendously detailed breakdown of exactly what Teshuvah is. He starts with a chapter dealing with 20 behavioral adjustments a person 
needs to make in order to do uh, effective teshuva from regret all the way through to apology, all of the different psychological states that affect teshuva, the six paths in which a person is aroused to teshuva. He even has a section there on uh, nine reasons why people uh, delay doing teshuva. Uh, he talks also about uh, concepts of, you know, the, the weight of various commandments and punishments and the different degrees of atonement that a person can attain, a real scientific breakdown of the concept of teshuva. We don't have time now to go into too much detail on that, but that's worth looking at if you want to look at the most complete uh, model of teshuva coming out of the Middle Ages, written by Rabbeinu Yonah as a consequence of his own personal teshuva and his own personal inner transformation that he was not afraid to say and to talk about and to express to the whole world about how he had been wrong and about he had, how he had fundamentally uh, changed who he was and his relation to the world. So that's the first example. Admitting mistakes, very, very difficult, especially for thought leaders and especially for entire communities. But we see communities make mistakes, leaders make mistakes, in ideology and in the way they look at the world. Uh, the second example I want to talk about to bring out a slightly different point about Teshuvah is what we might call the concept of communal acceptance. Some people, some people, well, I'm not saying anyone in this room, but some people find it very, very difficult to accept the teshuva of others. People find it very convenient to label people. And when a person transforms into someone else, they don't want to accept it. Especially communities can be very tough. Once you're on the outer, you're always on the outer. But this is contrary to Jewish values, my friends. Very contrary to Jewish values. When a person comes in humility and contrition and says, I have done wrong and I want to do teshuva, the community needs to accept them. If God accepts them, and we've vouchsafed by the prophets of Israel that God accepts the penitent regardless of what you've done, then why would the community not accept them? And the famous case here, of course, tragically, uh, is the case that I've spoken about elsewhere, but I'll just briefly discuss now, is the famous case of Uriel da Costa. Because Uriel da Costa, uh, and the, I'm sure uh, those of you, uh, most of you are familiar with Uriel da Costa, but I'll just uh, briefly uh, discuss that. Of course, he's living in the first half of the 16th, uh, of the 17th century, and he's, uh, well... He's obviously descended from uh, Portuguese uh, conversos, but he finds himself eventually in Hamburg and then in Amsterdam. And Oriel da Costa was one of those first generation uh, critics, skeptical critics of Judaism. He wrote uh, some uh, quite outrageous pamphlets critiquing the Bible, critiquing Jewish thought, and particularly critiquing rabbinic interpretations of the Bible. Uh, and he found himself excommunicated uh, in uh, excommunicated in Hamburg, excommunicated by the very powerful Beth Din of Venice, uh, and ultimately excommunicated where he was living in Amsterdam. And this is a complex story, and it's back and forth. And Uriel da Costa goes through various uh, manifestations of this. We have a good, It's a fascinating figure. Never got time to go into detail now. The critical point is, is that by the time you get to around 1540, Uriel da Costa wants to do teshuva and come back into the community. And the community said, well, okay, but you have to do a few things in order for us to accept you back. The first thing is that you need to uh, receive 39 lashes. They're going to be publicly given to you before we'll accept you back into the community. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine saying, someone saying, oh, I'd like to become a member of Caulfield Shul? And they say, well, first of all, 
you need to take 39 public lashes that the rabbi is going to administer to you. Uh, of course, different time, different place, uh, very difficult community Amsterdam. They had a whole range of other concerns and pressures. But Uriel da Costa submitted to this public lashing, amazingly. And then they said, oh, there's just one more thing you have to do. And that is that next Shabbat morning, you have to lie on the floor at the entrance to the synagogue and everybody coming into shul is going to walk over you. This, uh, this might sound to some like um, nothing too radical, but it was and still would be an uh, incredibly humiliating experience that they put him through. And he did it. And everybody who came into shul that day actually walked over him on the way into shul. But that had a horrendous aftermath. Because uh, a month later, uh, he committed suicide. He killed himself because the humiliation and the mental anguish of that uh, was too great. Uh, and we can kind of understand that. But it had a very powerful aftermath as well. Um, I want to show you uh, a famous painting that some of you will have seen uh, of Uriel da Costa. It's a painting done by Samuel Hershenberg around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, it's, a, it's, an amazing, um, it's an amazing painting. I just want to bring it up. Uh, who is that? So this is a picture of Uriel da Costa painted by uh, Samuel Hersenberg around the 20th century. And who's sitting on his lap? Who's that golden child sitting on da Costa's lap? It is, of course, Spinoza. Uh, Baruch Spinoza would have been about an amazing painting. I haven't got time to go into why, how amazing that painting is in different ways. But uh, Spinoza was uh, probably around eight years old. Uh, and almost impossible not to imagine that he would not have seen the humiliation that was doled out to Uriel da Costa. And if the community of Amsterdam thought that they had quashed heresy and dissent and apicursus by dealing harshly with da Costa, well, they were in for a big surprise because the greatest skeptic and heretic of the whole of the 17th century emerged from Amsterdam from that very community, and that, of course, was Spinoza. I'm not, just, I'm not talking about uh, Spinoza as a, as a global thinker and how amazing he was right now, but just in the context of the aftermath of the Da Costa episode. But the real focus on the tragedy is the fact that Da Costa was a very fine mind and a very interesting mind, but a Jewish person who wanted, at the end of the day, to do Teshuvah because he wanted to find meaning in the world through his community, and the community rejected his teshuva. They made the conditions far too harsh. And there's a huge lesson in that. There's a lesson for all of us. There's a lesson in tolerance. If we can't find in ourselves the way in which we can deconstruct ourselves to do a deep and abiding teshuva of transformation, then let us at least be tolerant as a community of the thoughts and views and actions of others. And that's a, that's a very abiding lesson that emerges from Teshuvah. And the third episode I want to talk about, so we've talked about admitting mistakes. We've talked about communal acceptance of the penitent. But I just want to give one very famous example, probably the most famous Baal Teshuvah of the 20th century, uh, when we talk about the power of personal transformation uh, it's very difficult to not mention the incredible uh, teshuva of Franz Rosenzweig. Uh, Rosenzweig, who's... Um, well, when, when we say teshuva, uh, Rosenzweig's teshuva is a return to Jewish community. It is a return to the Jewish people. It's a return to uh, living a life that is filled with spiritual values. It's not in Rosenzweig's case that he was necessarily 
uh, it's not that Rosenzweig was a bad person. Rosenzweig was an amazing person, but he was lost. He was drifting. Uh, Rosenzweig, as you know, are born into uh, a very, very celebrated uh, intellectual, cultural German-Jewish family in the second half of the 19th century. So uh, at a time where emancipation of German Jewry had already taken hold, uh, but a lot of Jews, despite emancipation, in order to get further in society, were still making outward conversions to Christianity. That was not for Rosenzweig. Rosenzweig was far too integral to do that kind of thing. But as he started, uh, he read a lot of German idealist philosophy. He's becoming a philosophy. He's becoming a very bright thinker. But as a result of some conversations he has in around uh, 1913 uh, with some uh, close friends, particularly Eugene Rosenstock and so on, uh, I'm summarizing the very complex biography of Rosenzweig, obviously. He decides he's going to convert to Christianity. But uh, he makes this realization, I mean, he's Rosenzweig at the end of the day. Uh, he's not going to go into the church as a goy. I mean, he's not some pagan converting to Christianity. He's going to go into the church as a Jew. And therefore, before he converts, He's going to go to shul on Yom Kippur. And that's why this is relevant to this week. We've got Yom Kippur coming up on a Monday, on Sunday and on Monday. So he decides that he's going to go to a shtibble in Berlin and he's going to spend Yom Kippur there. And after he has resolved himself with his father in heaven and cleared himself and gone through the Day of Atonement, then he's going to walk as an atoned Jew into the church and begin a relationship with Christ. And uh, because he found that, that, that he himself did not have the answers to the questions that were being posed to him. The only answers that were being presented to him were answers that came from Christianity, and he himself did not have those answers. But amazingly, he decided to go to shul on Yom Kippur. And uh, famously, he went to shul on Yom Kippur. He spent the day there. He underwent some kind of deep mystical experience in shul on Yom Kippur that uh, he doesn't talk a lot about afterwards, although he had come what he calls face-to-face -face with the nothing during that period uh, beforehand. I mean, he'd sat in a room with a pistol for hours asking himself whether or not this is what he wanted to do. It was a very big decision, but something deeply transformative happened. And where Rosenzweig does talk about it, he talks about it in terms of the fact that he suddenly found, he suddenly realized that Judaism was what was, and, and particularly standing in shul on Yom Kippur as an individual, spiritually naked before God, not requiring any intermediaries, but in a deep and direct relationship with the creator of the universe and our father in heaven, and yet as part of a community, a community who was standing together and to do repentance with the community uh, was uh, the, ultimate, the ultimate balance of communal and individual and meaning in life and identity in the world that Rosenzweig had been seeking. It is a tremendous privilege to be a part of the Jewish world and have that identity and have that ability to stand as an individual as part of a community. As a result, Rosenzweig began to see Teshuva as a form of revelation. It's not just an aspect of Jewish spirituality, it is ultimately what Jewish spirituality is all about. Everything for Rosenzweig was about the revelation of God in the world to the individual and to community and to humanity as a whole. And Teshuvah is the key to that. Teshuvah is the key to that. Teshuvah representing a response, representing a return, 
is the revelation of God in the world. It is the deepest and most abiding quality of Jewish values in the world, of the revelation of God in the world. And we could say a lot more about Rosenzweig. It's very difficult within 30 seconds to summarize Rosenzweig's philosophy. We're talking about the most influential Jewish philosopher of the 20th century. But it begins, and of course, he never, he doesn't go into the church after that Yom Kippur. It begins uh, by him going to shul and standing there, stripped of all pretense and all clever theological arguments. They all go out the window when you're standing there with God asking for forgiveness for the person you've been and seeking a more integral and authentic existence going forward. If that is what we can achieve from Yom Kippur, if that is what we can achieve from uh, our Teshuvah, even if we can't do all the work of breaking ourselves down and transforming ourselves from within, at least to ask God and the creator of the universe to help us to have an authentic relationship with the divine and with the world, then the revelation of the divine will come into the world uh, through the concept of Teshuvah. So with those words, I wish everyone a Gemar Hatim Atova. I hope everyone has a meaningful Yom Kippur that we're all able, to, we're all given the strength to look inside ourselves, to admit our mistakes, to be tolerant of the mistakes of others, and ultimately to see in the act of Teshuvah the true revelation of the divine. Gemar Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.